Rub up your engines! Today I'm going to show you how you can use water to clean the inside of your engine. Now back in the day, when we had carbureted cars, we'd get a bottle of Windex, we'd empty it out, put water in it, take the air filter out, open up the carbs, we'd spray some in, the water would get in, then it would steam clean the inside of your engine. Now don't try that on a modern car, there's too much crap that can go wrong. You can blow up your car, you can do all kinds of damage. Now, see these guys, they have a truck with machine that works it. But how do we know if it works? Well, I don't know either, because I never used it. So, here's what we're going to do. We're going to look inside the engine with a bore scope. All we got to do is take out a spark plug. Easy enough to do on this engine. Well, I mean, it's not as easy, but the magnet fell out of my little socket, so we got a little grabber here. We'll grab the spark plug. And we're going to look inside. Now, this is a brand new Dapstick DS700. And I got to say, it looks pretty good. What do you see with the pictures it takes? Okay, here we go. Check it out. Look at the carbon inside this engine. Look at it. They got a little bitty Honda generator that runs their system that's going to inject it into the car. Taking my car apart. He's putting a hose in as close to the throttle and the intake as possible. Hooking it all up and that's hooked up to the machine. Those of you who doubt me and think my Celica doesn't run anymore, well, watch this. It's a Toyota. Now what's happening is this machine is going to feed inside of the engine. The machine is breaking the hydrogen down to hydrogen and oxygen and that gas mix goes in here. So unlike what we used to do in the 60s, spraying water with a spray bottle, you don't have to worry about blowing your engine up from getting too much water in because there's not a liquid going into the engine. It's a gas, right? And it makes a big difference. That's why don't get yourself a spray bottle. Unless you got a junker and you want to take a chance of blowing the engine up, the gas is just going to clean it out. And unlike solvents, you don't get the solvents in the system, might destroy your head gasket. You're not going to break off big chunks that might get stuck in your catalytic converter. Very interesting thing. We're going to see what it looks like when it's done. Eh? So it takes about 30, 35 minutes. And as you can see, okay, it's still running good. Now, you do a cleaner setup, you got to rub the engine up, it stumbles. So a lot of times you check, engine light's going to come on. You're going to get horrible smoke coming out of the exhaust. None of which is the case today. Years ago when I was in downtown Houston, I was using a cleaner and it was a very good cleaner. And I used my compressor, pressurized it, shoot it in, right? All the smoke was coming out. Neighbors called the fire department. Boy, and they gave me hell. They said, what are you doing putting smoke down in downtown Houston, la la la? You can see. This thing is not destroying anything. I have to rub it one more time. Get any pieces out. Disconnecting everything. I got the spark plug. The same one we looked at before. Out it comes. And since the magnet's gone, out comes a grabber. I'm not going to touch it because it's hot. But as you can also see, it's very clean. <laughs> and here comes the bar scope. And as you can see here, it's cleaned all this off so we can see markings. Now you're always going to get a little bit of stuff on there. This is the pistons after all. So what we're going to do now is view to the side. In a side view, I'm going to turn the light down because it shines too much. See how clean the bar is. Look, the metal's shining now. And the big thing is, this was originally set up for diesel engines because diesels build up a lot of carbon and it'll fix turbochargers from build up. They'll get better gas mods. Now you might think these big fleets, they actually got 9% better fuel mileage. Now you got to take in consideration, okay, they only get seven miles a gallon, but that percentage over the course of the year is saving these guys thousands of dollars, right? Carbon is going to build up, especially in diesels. And they can do this process on a whole fleet of diesels. I advise they contact the federal government and get a grant because they're going to clean the diesels out. And hey, I want to cut of that action if it comes true. <laughs> now, if you're curious, they got a good website that I'm just going to show. And you can see pictures of some of the diesels they worked on to see how the diesel particulate filters were cleaned out and did not have to be replaced at a small fortune just by using this cleaning system. There it is. If you don't use phones anymore, nobody uses 1-800 numbers anymore. There it is. So yes, my conclusion is you can clean your car with water. Not the outside, the inside. But if you're going to try it without one of these machines, I want to advise you to. You might blow the engine up. This is all monitored by computers. The car runs perfectly fine. It's clean inside. But especially if you have a diesel, 
something like this, what most guys want because it doesn't have the chemicals. So it doesn't put polluting smoke all over the place. And for the guys that run the machines, you don't have to buy all these expensive chemicals. A bottle that's $39 and you might need three of them. This uses distilled water, pretty cheap, right? Go to the uh, drugstore and buy some distilled water. That's what the machine runs on it. It breaks it into the hydrogen. So yes, you can clean your vehicle with water. Or I should say, you can pay somebody to clean your car with water. <laughs> And here's some bonus questions and answers. Where well, you think it's bad where you are in Texas with the historic heat, cars are now breaking in unexpected ways. It's so hot, the wipers are breaking, the rubber's melting off, and then of course you turn the wipers on, it scratches your windshield. And of course it's even causing mushy brakes. The rubber gets too hot, then they start seeping, and then your brakes don't work. You wouldn't think heat was going to do that, but it can do all kinds of things. Of course you expect dead car batteries. Car batteries aren't good when it's really cold or when it's really hot. So they're getting a lot of dead car batteries. They're also getting flat tires because of course a lot of people don't check their tires much anymore, right? So if you run low on pressure, the tires are lower and with the heat, you're going to get a flat tire faster. It's going to seep out more and the lower your pressure, the hotter the tire gets when you drive it because there's too much friction. There's too much flat tire on without enough air pressure. So you got to make sure you check your tire pressure because if it's low, the heat's going to destroy it when you get on the highway. So plan ahead for the heat, you know, change your wiper blade if they're old, keep air pressure in your tires. Check your brake fluid. And if it's bad, a lot of it absorbs a lot of water and the heat makes the moisture in the water even worse. There are test strips that we mechanics have. We just stick a test strip in the brake fluid and it'll show you the percentage of moisture. And if it's too hard, the little strip will show red, meaning it's time to change your brake fluid too. Stuff you may never have thought about that you can think about now. Well, you think you hide your computers and phones and stuff in your trunk or hiding them under the seat of your car. Guess what? Thieves can figure that out. They are now using high tech devices to scan your vehicle to see what is in there. And then if they say, ooh, gee, there's stuff in there. The laptop, phone, they break the window and then steal it. Now they have a real epidemic of this in the San Francisco Bay Area, amongst other epidemics that they have. No wonder everyone's leaving San Francisco, but they can do it anywhere. They get these receiving devices that can pick up what's happening to see if you've got a Bluetooth phone or a laptop that's enabled. They're signal detectors. One woman was walking home in San Francisco. She saw five vehicles in a row that had the window smashed. People had left the electronic devices inside. The Thieves had little scanners. Ah, oh, there's one in here. Doesn't matter if you got it hidden in a trunk or hiding under the seat or in a bag or something. It will read it and that will steal. So don't think just because people can't see it, they can't steal it. Now, of course, if you turn your phone off and leave it in there, then it's not broadcasting anything. Even when your phone isn't being used, it's still on and there's signals going on because it picks up when you have phone calls and stuff, right? Same thing with computers and laptops. If you have them on, then don't turn them off. So if you're going to leave that crap in your car, believe you me, turn it off. Turn any device off because if you don't, they can get this broadcaster. They know something's in there, break your window and steal it. Yeah, they're high tech and the stuff doesn't cost that much. It's only a few hundred bucks for these things. So be leery about what you leave in your car, even if they can't see it. One of these scanners, they can find out you got something in there. Well, America's most tech forward city, San Francisco, has doubts about self driving cars. Waymo and stuff, they're trying to get self driving cars. They've been practicing there. The police departments don't like it. The fire departments don't like it. And like I say, one of the problems with these stupid things are, as you can see in this picture, that one's blocking the intersection. Why is it blocking the intersection? Because the self driving cars have pretty much fail safe. If they're confused, it's not that hard to confuse some of these computers, they stop the vehicle from moving so it doesn't hit anything. Well, then it can block up the traffic, right? Both Waymo and Cruz have been trying these things. They've been creating problems. Now, on August 10th of this year, the city's going to vote on whether they can expand this. Realize it's a very limited area that the self-driving things are in now, and they want to expand it, of course, but the city has to allow them. And who knows what will happen on that? Since the city's doing it, I'm sure politicians there, like everyone else, can be easily bribed with money, especially at a city level. You're not talking about Washington, D.C. You're talking about city corruption. And I've seen city corruption in Chicago, Houston. I'm sure San Francisco has got plenty of it, too. So realize these companies are spending billions trying to get the self driving stuff out. So they're just pushing, pushing, pushing to get them out. To me, I think the whole thing is a stupid idea, right? Uber drivers, taxi drivers, that gives people a job. So all the millions of people that are doing that, they'll be out of a job. It's going to cost more. They're going to create more 
more problems. I think it's a stupid idea, but of course, when companies put billions into something, they're not just gonna lie down and say, okay, gee, I guess our idea was stupid, it didn't work out. No, they're gonna try ramming it down people's throats because they invested so much money into the stuff. I guess they've watched too many Total Recall movies and they went self-driving taxis with maybe robot men like in there driving them around, right? We'll see what happens in San Francisco, but I mean, uh, they don't seem to be working out all too well. So if you never want to miss another one of my new car repair videos, remember to ring that bell.